York Society Library. Uh, before we begin, I just want to ask if you have any cell phones or other sort of devices, please turn them off so that they don't interrupt the presentation. Thank you. We're really pleased to present wonderful lectures like the one you, hear you will hear tonight, but we must rely on our members and friends to support the library above and beyond membership fees. We just recently kicked off our annual appeal, and it is my hope that you will give as generously as possible so that we can maintain our expanded hours in this beautiful building, improve our collections, and continue to uh, provide great programs like tonight. I expect that those of you here who are members of the New York Society Library uh, would agree that one of the many wonderful things about the library is our nine floors of uh, book stacks, uh, of open book stacks, I should say. Um, so I think then that you will be uh, particularly delighted, as I was, uh, to hear that the seed for Janice Nomura's new book, Daughters of the Samurai, A Journey from East to West and Back, took root right here at the New York Society Library. She discovered a book published in 1893 on the shelf down in stack one that took her off on a grand discovery um, which resulted in this book. Um, it was actually particularly pleasing to me because stack one happens to be my sort of favorite rabbit hole in the building too. So. Um, I'll let you tell her about, I'll, I'll let her tell you about, you know, how that all came to be. But the book she has written is a wonderful, skillfully told narrative about three Japanese girls who were sent to the United States in 1871 to learn Western ways in order that they would return to nurture a new generation of enlightened Japanese men. The Los Angeles Review of Books has written that Miss Nomura has achieved the elusive dream of the historian producing a work that will engage and satisfy academic and non-specialist audiences alike. And the Washington Post wrote, you'd be hard pressed to find a novelist who is as deft at portraying relationships and inner thoughts. High praise indeed. <coughs> Janice Nomura is a book critic and independent scholar. Daughters of the Samurai is her first book. Please join me in welcoming Janice Nomura. Turned its back 
on the, west of the, on the rest of the world in a very conscious way. At the beginning of the 1600s, it had thrown out all foreigners, killed off people who had converted to Christianity, uh, closed foreign trade to one boat docking in one port once a year. If you've read The Thousand Autumns of Jacob de Zut, not in there, um, that is an excellent depi depiction of that one boat in that one port. Can I recommend it anyway? Um, so for those 250 years, Japan was not particularly on top of what was happening in the wider world, and the wider world was completely ignorant of what was happening in Japan. If you were Japanese and you happened to leave the country by accident, which you weren't allowed, but if your fishing boat was wrecked and you ended up on a desert island or picked up by a foreign ship, you weren't allowed to come back. So it was really a, a, an extraordinary national seclusion. This is a map that was done in the 18th century by one of the Europeans who visited that one port once a year. As you can see, it's impressionistic. Um, but by the mid 19th century, this was being, this, this, this stance, this, this, uh, this ignorance of the wider world, this resolute refusal to look at it was not sustainable. 1853, Commodore Matthew Perry, everybody's heard of him, I would bet, um, steams into Edo Bay. Edo is what is now called Tokyo with five of these um, American warships bristling with cannon, belching coal smoke. Uh, if you've seen Stephen Sondheim's Pacific Overtures, four black dragons, although there were five. Um, I guess it was better for the lyrics. Um, <laughs> belching fire. Um, to the people on shore in Edo, it seemed as though the end of the world had arrived. This was not just a show of technological strength. It was a show of supremacy. If Japan was to maintain its own sovereignty, it was going to have to find a way to answer this. This is an island nation who at this point had no navy and had a few cannons left over from the early 1600s. So in the space of a single lifetime or a single reign, Japan did catch up. The lifetime, the reign, being that of this man. This is the Meiji Emperor. This is the same guy. Um, in his court robes, as emperors had looked for thousands of years, uh, cloistered in Kyoto, and then after a brief and bloody civil war had deposed the, sh the shogunate, the, the, the shogun was the military dictator who really held the power, a brief civil war took him out and replaced him with the emperor who was moved to what was now going to be called Tokyo, looking like the model of a modern major general now in his very Western style garb. Um, in a stroke, this attitude that we are going to not pay attention to the West was reversed. Uh, the, the, the young and very energetic statesman who supported this emperor uh, created something called the Charter Oath, which said explicitly, we will now go out around the world and find out everything about everything in order to make Japan strong. We are going to find out everything about Western ideas in order to resist the West. So, ambassadors filed out around the world to learn everything about agriculture, industry, uh, in, uh, manufacturing, weapons, technology, fashion. You can see it happening in this picture. Um, somebody still in their court robes with their samurai top knot in place, but leather shoes, a top hat, and his henchmen now have already changed their hairstyles and acquired their Western clothing. Uh, the Meiji era was an identity crisis on a national scale. What to keep, what to, what to replace with Western ideas. Um, in Tokyo, people were asking questions like, should we eat beef? Should we uh, throw out the Japanese language and replace it with English? It was a crazy moment of anything goes. And then, <coughs> having fallen in love with this era that was full of stories, I got very lucky very lucky, in the sub-sub-sub-basement of this building, stack one. I think Carolyn and I both like stack one because we're small. If you're any taller than I am, it's a dangerous place, and it keeps out all the other people. Um, stack one is where they keep the Japan travel books. And you have to understand that after Commodore Perry, after the quote-unquote opening of Japan, which Japanese scholars would argue wasn't really that easy to define, but anyway, but that's a different book. Um, everybody who visited Tokyo or its newly opened ports of the north and south, whether they were a missionary's wife or a trader or a soldier of fortune, came home and wrote a book. And they're all lined up down there. Um, 
And they have fabulous, crazy titles. Let's see if I can point some of them out. Um, titles like In Bamboo Lands, uh, Behind the Screens in Japan, Japan as we saw it, The Spell of Japan. I mean, they're goofy titles. And there's a lot of misinformation in these books. And I, fresh from my master's degree in Japanese history, since I knew everything about the Meiji era, found them funny. So I like to hide out down there and read them. And then one day, I stumbled upon this book, which was different. It was slim and green and understated, and it was called simply A Japanese Interior. And it was written by a woman named Alice Mabel Bacon. Alice was a New Haven school teacher. She was writing, it was basically an epistolary memoir, a collection of letters she had written to her family while she was in Tokyo for a year in 1888-89, one school year teaching in a school called the Puresses School, a school for girls, uh, the daughters of the elite, which was interesting enough. There was no girls' education until just this moment in Japan. Um, it had, the the, the Puresses School was actually founded a year after my school here, my girls' school, Brewery, um, another blue stocking uh, establishment. <laughs> Although the Puresses School was more of a finishing school. So Alice had taught there for a year, and she sounded in this book <laughs> like one of my teachers at Burley. In fact, some of them are sitting here tonight, people whose voice I heard when I, when I, when I read Alice. Um, she was very frank, she was very open-minded, but very opinionated at the same time. Um, but something she said in her introduction really made me question it. What was she all about? She wrote, while living in Japan, she had stayed not with foreigners, but with Japanese friends that she had known long and intimately in America. And for a New Haven woman in 1888, this was just odd. New Haven women wouldn't have had an opportunity to get close with Japanese women in America and then gone to Tokyo. It, there, was, there was a larger story here, and there was. And it starts with these guys. 1871, the largest and most prestigious of the missions that set out from Japan to learn everything about everything. This one was called the Iwakura Mission, and it was led by the guy in the middle, Prince Tomomi Iwakura, uh, who had been a courtier and had morphed into a supporter of the emperor in Tokyo, um, a bridge from old to new. And in the fall of 1871, he was preparing, along with a hundred scholars and statesmen, to set out around the globe for what would be two years. Uh, it's hard to uh, grasp just how um, extraordinary this mission was. It, it's as if the entire Senate and the President and Vice President and most of Congress all set out and left on a boat at the same time to go and find stuff out only to return two years later. Uh, you know, this was sort of unprecedented. So they were getting ready to go. Um, and as they were getting ready, another supporter of the emperor, a man who had previously traveled in America, sort of piped up. He said, you know, when I traveled in America, I noticed something about the women. The women were different. They had read a great deal. They were fairly well educated. They had opinions. They voiced their opinions. And their men listened. And this was very different from anything that this man had ever experienced at home in Japan, where women were either running the home or they were entertainers. They were either, you know, making things go, or they were making polite conversation and filling sake cups. Um, women who actually supported their men intellectually were unknown. Maybe, he said, maybe Americans are so successful, American men, that the American industrialists that we're trying to emulate, maybe they're so successful because of this, so, this emotional and spiritual and intellectual support they get from their women. Maybe we need to do something in this mode. Maybe, okay. Why don't we take a bunch of little girls, send them off with the embassy? You know, we're dropping off um, young men to study in famous universities in the West. Why don't we drop off some little girls in America? We'll leave them there for 10 years, all expenses paid, and then we'll bring them back. And they will help spawn a new generation of enlightened men to leave Japan. The, the phrase somebody used was, as a little leaven leavens the whole lump. It was like they were going to be the yeast that helped Japan. Um, so recruiting notices went out. Wanted young girls of the samurai class, the uh, sort of warrior class, the bureaucratic, educated class, 
uh, for 10 years studied abroad, all expenses paid, um, there were no applicants. So the very phrase, girls studying abroad, was impossible. Was that, that girls didn't study and girls didn't go abroad, much less girls studying abroad. Um, the recruiting notices had to go out two times, and just before the embassy was due to leave, they scraped together five families who were willing to risk a daughter. And here they are. These were five families, five different families, so five girls from five different families, but they all had a significant amount in common. These five families had all found themselves on the wrong side of that brief and bloody civil war that I mentioned. Uh, they had backed the Chauvin and they had been wrong, and they had lost everything. At the same time, they were families who had an unusually acute understanding that Western ideas were the way forward for Japan. Uh, one of them had been an English interpreter for the Chauvin. Uh, one of them had previously traveled abroad, uh, these fathers. They understood something about what lay outside Japan, and they, having other children, including sons, were thinking maybe risking a daughter, not having to feed her for 10 years, might reap the reward of having her come back and bring with her some of the prestige that they had lost. So here are the five girls. The two on the outside, the big ends, were about 14. The one in the dark kimono was 11, sorry, 10. The one in the middle was 11. And the small one was six. Um, 1871 set out from Yokohama on the Pacific Mail Steamer America. That's this boat out here. This is a painting that was done much later, but it gives you a good sense of the scene with some poetic license. Um, launches setting out from the docks, carrying all the delegates out to the steamer waiting in, in Yokohama Bay. Um, Prince Iwakura here in his, in his court robes on the lead launch with Charles DeLong, the American ambassador, with him. And Charles DeLong's wife, Mrs. DeLong, Mrs. Elida Vineyard DeLong, was going to be the chaperone for the five girls that were being sort of tacked on as an afterthought. And here they are in this launch. The one piece of documentary truth in this painting is that the little one, whose name was Ume, who's wearing red, that kimono still exists in an archive in Tokyo. Three weeks across the stormy Pacific to San Francisco, where they landed in January 1872, uh, and became a sensation. First, the Iwakura Embassy was a sensation. America was incredibly gratified at the arrival of this embassy of Japanese statesmen or princes or something, something impressive, they, they seemed very impressive, who had arrived in America saying, teach us, show us how to do the things that you do so well. Think about what decade this is. This is the 1870s. The American centennial is at hand. At last, they are not the upstart nation. They are a nation to whom an ancient land is turning for advice to make themselves great. So the men of the Iwakura mission were covered in the newspapers every day, whether they were visiting a, a mill or a gold mine or a bank or a foundry or just having lunch, the, the papers covered them. The girls were not out in public all that much, but when they were, they were even more of a sensation because they looked like this. This is Harper's Weekly. Um, no one had thought to get the girls some of that nice Western camouflage that a lot of the statesmen were already wearing. So whenever they appeared in public, they were wearing their, their, the kimonos that they had left in. Um, Mrs. DeLong here in the center, uh, and looking, I think, I think this is a very good documentary etching because I think she really was pretty pleased with herself that she got to be at the center of attention whenever these rather colorful chicks came out with her, the mother hen. Um, she was not in a hurry to help them find the camouflage that they needed. And, and I was very gratified because I sort of went out on a limb. I read between the lines of all the sources and concluded that this is what Mrs. DeLong was like. And then during the summer after the book came out, I got an email from a woman named Christy McCarthy who said, I am Elida Vineyard DeLong's great granddaughter. <laughs> and for all I know from the stories that have come down to me and the family, that's exactly what she was like. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that was Mrs. DeLong. Um, off they went from San Francisco on the Transcontinental Railroad, at this point only in operation for three years. So this is the Golden Spike had been founded in 1869. They were doing something that most Americans hadn't been able to do yet. And off they went via Sacramento, Salt Lake, where they were snowed in for three weeks. That's a whole other book right there, um, among the Mormons. 
through Chicago and to Washington, D.C., where they arrived on leap day, 1872, having finally procured some hideously ugly Western dresses. Um, the two in the middle, the older ones, at this point, it was becoming clear that they were not going to be able to fulfill this mission that they'd been given, this 10 years of study, followed by returning to help Japan. They, in the context of their own culture, they were almost of marriageable age. Um, they were not as adaptable as the other girls. They were homesick, one of them was physically ill, and so once they reached Washington, they were turned around and sent back to Japan, leaving the three younger ones, who at this point are seven, 10, and 11, um, to start their American educations in earnest in three separate families. They were placed with three separate families so that they could really assimilate and get their English going and, and become Americanized. Um, but it was, despite their separation, this year of transit where they had moved from Japan to Washington to foster American families, um, they formed a bond, this trio, that lasted for the rest of their lives. You have to imagine for a second how different their path was from every other one of their countrymen and everybody else in, in, the, in the land to which, in which they had arrived. They were other to everyone except each other. And they formed a country of three that sustained them together for the rest of their lives. Um, this, this picture was actually taken in 1876 when they came together to visit the Philadelphia Centennial. And this is all, so this is now four years after they've arrived and they're very comfortable in their Western clothes. They went and toured the Japanese pavilion you think about the <laughs> paradox of that. Um, okay, so the older two, Sematsu Yamakawa in the center in the stripes, and Shige Nagai to, her, to the right here, um, were sent to New Haven uh, to foster families in New Haven. And the youngest one, Ume, uh, stayed in Washington and became the foster child of a couple in Georgetown. So why were the two older ones sent to New Haven? Partly, it was because of this man, Kenjiro Yamakawa. You might recognize, I just said that name. Kenjiro was Sematsu's big brother, and he was the first Japanese undergraduate at Yale. He had been sent a few years earlier by the new emperor to start studying physics and engineering and bring those skills back to Japan. He was already in New Haven, and he was appalled that his sister had been sent out to America for 10 years. How was a girl 11 years old supposed to come and become American when she hadn't finished becoming Japanese? What was going to become of, her, of his sister if he wasn't looking out for her? So the Japanese uh, officials in Washington were only too happy to have this kind of automatic oversight uh, in New Haven. And through Kenjiro and his contacts at Yale, they found their way to this man, Leonard Bacon. Um, people familiar with New Haven? You. Okay, so New Haven is centered around a town green with three churches, and the center church on the green was Leonard Bacon's pulpit for 50 years. He was one of the most prominent congregational ministers in New England. Um, I love this picture because I cannot think of a man who looks more like a biblical patriarch than, than <laughs> Leonard. Um, he, despite his, uh, his craggy seniority, his magisterial air, he was another remarkably open-minded man. And so he agreed to take in Sematsu for the 10 years that she was going to be, be there. Shige was placed in the home of a colleague minister of his, also in New Haven. Um, a slight sidetrack on the joys of research. Um, for those of you who haven't yet uh, had the inc incredible thrill of finding something in a library that no one has touched in a very long time, um, uh, alas, not here, but in the New Haven Museum, formerly the New Haven Historical Society, I found this. Um, this is an autograph book. So Sematsu settled down with the Bacons and went to school with their youngest daughter, Alice. Remember Alice? She was the one who wrote the book downstairs. She was raised as Sematsu's foster sister. She was the youngest of Leonard Bacon's 14 children. And when, uh, when Sematsu arrived, she and Alice became extremely close. They went to school together around the corner on Grove Street in New Haven. And in the Historical Society was this autograph book. I, I dare say some of you have autograph books lurking in archival drawers in your own homes. Um, this belonged to a girl named Carrie, who was part of the class at this little academy, girls' academy on Grove Street. Um, and she invited both Sematsu and Alice to sign her book 
uh, it's very hard to see that top one. But think about 14-year-old girls for a second, 14 is easy, right? They were both around 14 or 15. Um, people who are not usually likely to stick out their necks and assert an identity that's different from everyone else's yet. Um, but Stamatsu had no trouble with her otherness. If you turn your head like this, um, you can see that she signed her name in Japanese kanji, um, marching down the page, Yamakawa Stamatsu. Uh, she was proud of who she was, and she wasn't afraid to put that down in Carrie's book. Meanwhile, Alice, also revealed a lot about herself in the way she signed Carrie's book. Alice was a real scholar in, in a very um, boys' education kind of way. She signed her page in ancient Greek. Uh, uh, and when I had a, a friend who's a classical scholar, a translator, he said, it says, cease your chatter and follow me. <laughs> I, I really want to know whether Carrie, the owner of the book, ever figured out what that page said. But anyway, a, a sidetrack on the delights and, and revealing things you can learn about teenage girls from 104 years ago when you're just looking around in an archive. Um, okay, back to the girls. Ume Tsuda, the six-year-old in the red kimono, spent 10 years growing up in Georgetown as the pampered only child of an older, childless couple, rather wealthy, well-connected. She was their darling. Uh, they called her their sunbeam from the land of the rising sun. Um, <laughs> She made the papers every time she gave a recitation at school or won a prize. She delighted their social set. She sat on Longfellow's lap. She shook the hands of senators. And after 10 years, she had forgotten every word of her Japanese. Um, she had become a very assimilated, rather spoiled American only child. And she finished high school with, in a blaze of glory. <coughs> Meanwhile, her two friends in New Haven were also extremely successful in the classroom. So successful that by the time they were ready, they were both accepted for matriculation at Vassar College. Um, Vassar then a young institution, only about a dozen years old. The first institution, the first institution of women's higher ed that was founded as a purpose-built thing. It didn't evolve out of other things. So this building, the main building on the Vassar campus, who's been there? People familiar with the Vassar campus a little bit? Um, this building was compared to the Tuileries. It was built to house an entire school, and it hadn't, you know, it wasn't being rigged from other buildings. I love this print because if you've been to the Vassar campus, you know that this walkway toward the main building is flanked with massive white pine trees, and they're they're there in their little baby state. <laughs> um, okay, so off they went to Vassar. Shige went as a music student. She enrolled at the Vassar School of Music for a three-year certificate in piano and voice. Uh, she delighted her friends with her concerts, but also with her personality. She was always uh, much sought after at parties, and she danced, apparently danced a mean Highland fling. Um, I guess that's an image I, I wish I could see. Uh, this is her as she left Vassar after three years, completing her certificate in music. Meanwhile, her friend Stematsu, here in her graduation picture in 1882, really was the dazzling one. She was accepted for the full bachelor's degree, the four-year BA, the first Japanese woman to earn a college degree anywhere. And within a year of her arrival, she had transcended her exotic origins to the point where she was elected president of the sophomore class. Uh, this is her in the red circle over here. Um, she was invited to join the Shakespeare Society, which was really only for the very finest English students. Keeping in mind that it's 1878 now, she's only been here for six years. Uh, she was the president of, the, of Philalethia, the, the campus literary organization. She was a marshal on Founders Day. She was a speaker at graduation. Her graduation speech was covered in the newspapers. It was on British foreign policy toward Japan. She was completely dazzling. And now 10 years have elapsed, right? Ume has finished her high school in Georgetown. Shige has finished her music certificate. Stematsu has finished her bachelor's degree and it is time to go home, home, which is now at least as foreign as America had been 10 years earlier. It never crossed these girls' minds to say, you know, I think we'll just stay here. Um, they were, as the title says, they were daughters of the samurai class, and that 
came with a degree of loyalty and diligence and obedience and honor that it's very hard for 21st century Americans, I think, to really fathom. I mean, we, we, could, we could say that we do, but I don't think we really can grasp how deeply this mission was felt by these girls. Um, so, Shige had the easiest time going back. Double uprooting. Why did she have an easy time? For two reasons. Um, here she is at back right in the middle of this let's go fishing picture with her friend Semaku and another friend. Um, part of why it was easier for her to go back to Japan was this fellow, Sotokichi Uryu. When Shige was growing up in New Haven, down the street were the Pittman family who had three girls who were her best friends. And at some point, the Pittmans decided to do as their neighbors had done and take in a Japanese foster child. They took in Sotokichi Uryu when he was a teenager. He needed to work on his English because he was going to enter the Naval Academy at Annapolis because he's in his cadet uniform. Um, so they sort of grew up together. And at a certain point, having realized that they were on paths that diverged wildly from everyone else in Japan, they realized that maybe that th those divergent paths could become the same road. And Shige went back to Japan with the excitement of a woman about to be married to the man that she had chosen, which for her class and moment was unusual. The other reason Shige had an easier time had to do with language and studies. She, Ume had lost all of her Japanese. Shige and Samatsu had hung on to their spoken Japanese because they had been together in New Haven and then together at Vassar, but they had lost their literacy in Japanese. They could no longer read and write. Um, but if you are a musician, to teach music, you don't necessarily have to read or write, and Western music was a skill that was actually really in demand in Tokyo at this moment. If you are going to try to impress Western statesmen, you have to entertain them Western style. You have to have state dinners, you have to have balls, you have to dance, and you have to play Western music. Um, this is a print by Chianobu called Dancing at the Rokumeikan. The Rokumeikan was a, let's say, hideously ornate <laughs> building built by the Japanese government as a guest house for foreign visitors. It's all curfewed in Western style. And once a week, the elite of Tokyo would gather there for ballroom dancing lessons. Um, a lot of people think that this woman in the yellow plaid is Shige, conducting one of these classes, and that the woman at the other keyboard would have been her student, kind of looking to her to set the tempo. Um, Shige had a skill that the Japanese government needed, and so she settled right into a job teaching at the Tokyo Government Music School, earning the highest salary that, of any woman in Japan. In fact, I think it may have been the only salary of any <laughs> woman in Japan. And she settled down with Sotokishi Uryu and raised seven children. Uh, she was a working mother before the term was coined. Many people would argue that it still hasn't really been coined in Japan. Um, so that was Shige. Meanwhile, her friend Sematsu, slightly older and much more dazzling, was having a much harder time. Right, she's left Vassar in a blaze of glory. The, the class prophet at graduation has said, you know, well, of course Sematsu is going to go back to Tokyo and found a school. Of course that's what she's going to do. Sematsu got back to Tokyo and found that without being able to read or write, there was very little she could do except for teach English. And having just come, sort of lifted on this wave of, of, of achievement, she wasn't particularly willing to settle into an anonymous English classroom and toil for the rest of however much. Um, at, right at this point of sort of increasing dismay, she received a sort of startling proposal from the man on the right. Wow, Oyama. It was a proposal of marriage, as you might have guessed, and it was startling for a bunch of reasons. First of all, Zamatsu had never intended to get married. She had always told everybody that she was going to join the noble army of spinsters and be an educator. Um, marriage hadn't really been in her plan. Then there was this man himself. He was 18 years older than she. He was very recently widowed with three very small daughters. And he was one of the most powerful men in the Meiji government. He was the minister of war. To top all that off, in that brief and bloody civil war that Sematsu had survived um, viscerally, she was in the final siege, the last battle. Her home castle had been besieged, and she was running around avoiding cannonballs, being fired by Oyama and his forces. Literally, she had shrapnel scars from you know, ordnance that he had fired. 
It was hard to imagine marrying this man at first. But then she started to think about having just spent 10 years being different from everyone. And if she remained single, she was going to spend the rest of her life being different from everyone in Japan because you didn't remain single on purpose in Japanese culture as a woman. And she didn't like the idea of that. And she also thought, rather than toiling anonymously in a Japanese class, in, in an English classroom, perhaps linked to this man and his circles of power, perhaps she could make some of the differences that she had intended to make from behind the scenes. And that's what she did. Then there was Ume. Ume came back, age 18, again, you know, with the, with the mindset of a rather spoiled and pampered American girl, an oddly sort of missionary mindset. You know, she sort of wrote to people as she was leaving, I'm off to the, to the you know, to the, to the murky orient. You know, that's how she was seeing things. She got to Japan and was not going to get married to anyone for any reason, stop talking to me about marriage. Part of this was the language barrier. She couldn't imagine marrying a man that she couldn't speak to at this point. She was absolutely without Japanese language. Part of it was that missionary mindset. Japanese men drank on Sundays. She wasn't going to join her life to one of them. So she did settle down in an English classroom at the newly opened Purest School, that school that Alice had written about. Um, and she taught and she taught. And she began to realize that because she had been so young, as a child in America, she had not had the chance to go to college. And now there were starting to be women in Japan who had more education than she did. And that didn't feel good because at heart, Ume was a rather competitive, fierce being. So she went back to America to study at Bryn Mawr for three years. Uh, she studied biology. She wasn't going to study anything that seemed feminine. She was going to make her mark. Um, she actually co-authored a paper on the orientation of the frog's egg came back from Bryn Mawr, and after some more teaching, this is now about 20 years after they had returned to Japan, she stunned everyone by quitting her teaching jobs, her prestigious government appointments, and founding a school of her own. So the prophet's prophecy came true just with the wrong girl. This school was not going to be a finishing school for the daughters of the elite. It was called Joshi Egakujuku, which translates loosely as the Women's Home School of English. It was designed to take young women of academic talent and train them to pass the English teaching certificate. This is the whole school at, at its inception. It's a small rented house, uh, Ume here in the middle. Alice came back to Tokyo for two years to help her get it off the ground. Sematsu was their royal patron because after 20 years of marriage to Oyama, who became one of the most successful statesman in the Meiji government. She was now Baroness Oyama, so she was their, their royal patron. Shige's daughters were going to go to this school when they became a little older. So the, the prophecy was coming true. This school, um, in its humble beginnings here, is now called Tsuda College, and it's one of the most prestigious women's colleges in Japan, with 4,000 undergraduates. Uh, Ume Tsuda's grave is in a corner of the campus, grove of plum trees, which is what ume means, plum tree. Um, and her undergraduates today tend to go and visit her grave when they have a, you know, a big exam or a challenging job interview and ask ume for some help. So here they are. This is in about 1902. Um, ume and Alice, Shige and Sematsu. Um, it's one of my favorite photos because, of course, it's one of the only, it's the only photo of the four of them together. These women who were so closely bonded to each other. Um, and it's also just extraordinary at this point, at their sort of triumphant moment of having founded the school that they had meant to do, to think about these three Japanese young women at this point, middle-aged women, who had been chosen essentially at random and yet had the grit and the intellectual firepower and the charm to be successful, both as children growing up here and then uprooted all over again um, believe me when I say that I have left out far more than I have put in, and I hope I have whetted the appetite of those who haven't actually read the book to go and learn more about this extraordinary story. I'm going to read just a brief part to give you a chance and to hear what the book sounds like and maybe whet your appetite further. The book begins 
um, sort of in the middle of things with what is one of the most powerful moments in this story. When the girls were selected, that photo of them in their kimonos, all lined up, looking very solemn, uh, they were granted an audience with the Empress. And this was unprecedented. The Empress did not meet with people outside of the court, especially little girls. Um, and they met with her, and she delivered their ma her mandate for them to go and study abroad. The power of that moment in their young imaginations cannot be overstated. So here's the scene. At last, they arrived in a cavernous inner chamber. A heavy bamboo screen hung there, but the girls dared not look up. Seated behind it, they knew, sat the Empress of Japan. The five girls knelt, placed their hands on the tatami matted floor, and bowed until their foreheads touched their fingertips. Lacquered trays on low stands appeared before them, bearing bolts of red and white silk, auspicious colors, as well as tea and ceremonial cakes, also red and white. The girls bowed, and bowed again, and again, staring down at the woven tatami between their hands. They did not touch the refreshments. A lady in waiting emerged, holding a scroll before her. Her hands were graceful and astonishingly white as she unfurled it. In a high, clear voice, using language so formal the girls could barely understand the words, she read what the empress had brushed with her own hand, words no empress had hitherto dreamed of composing. Considering that you are girls, your intention of studying abroad is to be commended, she chanted. Girls, studying abroad? The very words were bizarre. No Japanese girl had ever studied abroad. Few Japanese girls had studied much at all. The reedy voice continued. When, in time, schools for girls are established, you shall be examples to your countrywomen, having finished your education. The words were impossible. There was no such thing as a school for girls. And when they returned, if they returned, what kind of examples would they be? The lady in waiting had nearly reached the end of the scroll. Bear all this in mind, she concluded, and apply yourself to your studies day and night. This, at least, the girls could do. Discipline and obedience were things they understood. In any case, they had no choice. The emperor was the direct descendant of the gods, and these were the commands of his wife. As far as the girls knew, a goddess on earth, seeing but unseen, speaking with another's voice, had given them their orders. Thank you for listening. Since they lost their Japanese literacy early on, they wrote letters in English. Hooray! Um, <laughs> they wrote a lot of letters, especially Umetsuda, the youngest, um, had this very intense and close relationship with her foster mother in Washington. And from the day she got on the train to go back to get on the boat to go back to Japan, she started writing letters. And she wrote them until her foster mother died in her 90s. So that was a trove of material. The interesting thing also about the way these girls wrote is that since when they got back to Tokyo, they were really compromised in their ability to communicate and lonely and struggling and dismayed by the non-reaction of the government they had returned to help. Um, what they wrote in English in all of those letters was really impassioned. It was almost like, like therapy. It was, it was a cri de coeur. They, everything they wrote was remarkably emotional and frank and it became a terrific source and a great window into how they were feeling that you know a, a Victorian woman in normal circumstances wouldn't necessarily have done. Yeah. Right. Well, Shige was you know a mother of seven. Um, she had plenty. Uh, Stematsu, with her three young stepdaughters, also had three children of her own. Uh, Ume never married. She remained part of the noble army of spinsters and so never had any children, although you could say that her undergraduates are now for generations of children. Um, Stematsu, who in many ways I find the most poignant of these figures, never left Japan again. Ume 
went back to Bryn Mawr, and then also made many other trips. She spent a, a big chunk of time in London and did a lot of traveling as a women's educator to see how other women's educators were doing it. She, you know, uh, M. Carrie Thomas at Bryn Mawr was a huge influence on her. Um, and she gave, I know, traveled in 1909 back to an alumni gathering at Vassar with her husband, who was going to an alumni gathering in Annapolis, and they were quite the, the uh, celebrated couple on that tour. So yes, a little bit. They did. Um, the two older ones had held on to a lot of their, Jap their spoken Japanese. So it was rusty, but it came back pretty fast. Um, the youngest one, it took a while, and there are all these letters from her first years back in Tokyo saying, I wish I could speak my native language. Um, and even after she became fluent in speaking it, she never wrote it. None of them ever wrote it. And when she made a speech, you know, she was the head of a college, she would write the whole speech in English and have it translated and then read it in Japanese. I actually have some audio tape of her voice speaking. She sounds a little bit like Grace Kelly. <laughs> yeah? Where were all the different letters? I know there were Alan Sabers, but where did you have to go to find them? Right. Um, a lot of them were at Vassar. Uh, and some of them were at Yale because of the Bacon family papers and all of the Yale connections. Some letters were at Rutgers. Rutgers has a very old relationship with Japan. What some of the very first students to come out of Japan came and studied at Rutgers. Um, and then there was Tsuda College, which uh, was you know, basically a shrine to Umetsuda's memory, um, which of course created the paradox of uh, an archive that was trying to keep me out and protect her from me, um, <laughs> uh, which made it a little bit trickier. Doing research there and doing research here were two very different experiences. Everybody hear that? Um, that's a good question. Their return was unfortunately timed. The, the 1870s were the, the most progressive, most open-minded moment of the Meiji Restoration and the Meiji transition to a more Western-oriented focus. Um, anything went in that time. Ben Franklin and Samuel Smiles were the most popular authors in that time. Um, by the time the girls came back in 1882, just then, the pendulum had started to swing back the other way. And Confucius was all of a sudden where you wanted to be in the schools and not Ben Franklin anymore. The individual was not necessarily celebrated anymore. Um, so when they came back, they came back the way they had seen all of their male uh, colleagues go back. You know, young men like Semaki's brother who had come to study at Yale, learned physics, come back, and walked straight into very prestigious jobs. Samaki's brother was eventually the head of Tokyo University. Um, when the girls returned, there was a resounding silence. No one knew what to do with them except marry them off. Um, there was no plan for what to do with them. Um, and even though they were all successful beyond anyone's wildest dreams, in the moment, the way their peers looked at them was always tinged with suspicion. Their biggest supporters were always foreigners. All of the donors for Tsuda College were Americans um, and, and Brits. Their own countrymen, to their own countrymen, they were a little weird. They were fundamentally and irreversibly weird. There was a, 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 a novel published in the 1890s, um, very thinly disguised novel about Samasi's family in which she was cast as the evil stepmother who was trying to get rid of everything Japanese in the house and was confusing her children and, and was just bad. So you get a sense. Yeah. Was there ever an attempt for other girls to send over, or was it only these two, or do you know? Uh, it, it was sort of a one-off. It wasn't like there was a pipeline. Uh, one, they, they went and they came back, and then there was a gap. And it wasn't until mm, probably the early knots teens that people started coming to Bryn Mawr regularly. That's partly because Ume Tsuda came back from Bryn Mawr to Tokyo and established a scholarship with the help of her patrons in Philadelphia to bring a Japanese girl to Bryn Mawr every year. So it was because of Ume that that started to happen. And then it gradually, gradually more of a trickle of that. But no, this was absolutely a one-off. They were an afterthought, and no one had a plan for them while they were here, and no one had a plan for them when they got back. Yeah. 
Well, these were the families that had sent them, right? So there was some investment on the part of the families in what they were doing. They had just, the families had had the idea that this would be a good thing. So all of the families were quite welcoming, um, especially the two older ones who immediately made very good marriages. Whatever else they did was gravy, but they were married, they were settled. Um, Umayyad Suda had a little bit of a trickier time. Her father, although passionately pro-Western, was Japanese enough to want her to settle down um, and made things a little bit tricky for her that way. Um, when she founded her school and moved out in, into her own home, she took the, at that point, very strange step of removing herself from her own family registry. In Japan, even today, there is a piece of paper in the government office that is your family registry. And when you are a woman, if, if you marry, your name is removed from your father's and added to your husband's. I know because I did this when we moved to Japan. Um, she removed her name from her father's and started her own, which he didn't do. Um, so she sort of established herself in opposition to her family a little more than the others. I have. Um, during the course of the research, I, I, I met with or wrote, corresponded with descendants of all of them, um, and including people in Umayyad's family and in Alice's family, since they didn't have direct descendants. And then part of the deliciousness of this summer, as this book was published in May, and all summer, every every so often, I'll get an email from like Mrs. Malong's granddaughter, and then um, some other figures too. Some really delightful uh, coincidences, and and it, it's sort of that's when you touch the ghosts, for real. Was there ever an attempt by the Japanese government, while the girls were still here, to debrief them about their experiences to sort of reap the benefit of this investment that they had made by sending them here? Uh, except to disperse funds that they needed, there was really very little contact. Um, they, they really, I don't think that the Japanese officials here really believed that these girls were going to do anything when they went back, except maybe be examples by osmosis. So there wasn't, I mean, and, uh, and at the same time, the families that were fostering them were unusually passionate about the mission these girls had come with. The, the families took over the job of making them what they were in a way that I think the Japanese government never anticipated. The, 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 the American families had a very large sense of the, the, the importance of, this, of these girls' mission and they helped them fulfill it. It hasn't, but it is going to. I have just learned that there will be a Japanese publisher, which terrifies me because who knows what they're going to think of it. <laughs>
was largely the, the brainchild of a, of a, of a, of a madman in a way. Um, the, the man, that, that statesman who had suggested it, his name was Kiyo Takakurada. So why would they have listened to him? He was a very powerful statesman. And he had traveled, and not many people had. You know, the, the, the number of people who actually had firsthand experience in Western nations was like countable on one hand. And if you had, your word carried a tremendous amount of weight because no one could contradict you. What, what Kuroda had gone and seen was true. Um, he was also a very charismatic and forceful guy. He became Japan's first prime minister. Um, so he had the ear of the government. And also, it didn't cost them anything. It was really an afterthought to send these girls. It cost them nothing. And you know, the, 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 the members of the mission basically ignored them. And then they were dropped off and by pure luck ended up in these families who really loved them and wanted them to succeed in this crazy scheme. So it's a, it, that's sort of the extraordinariness. She was an extraordinary woman. Uh, you know, this is medieval cocoon is just about right. Uh, you know, uh, she had and, until she married the Meiji Emperor, she had never been outside of the imperial compound in Kyoto. She had never been outside of the compound. She had rarely been seen by anyone except her own ladies in waiting. And when she was suddenly married to this man, moved to what was now called Tokyo, um, that was bizarre enough. But then she was also given this mandate that she was going to be well versed in current events and she was going to be a representative of womankind to the Japanese people. These were all brand new ideas. There was no Japanese people until right here. I mean, there were individual domains, but it wasn't a nation until this moment. She was going to put on Western clothes and then she was gonna go out in public. You know, she was an equally extraordinary woman and she recurs in the book as a sort of motif, as sort of a parallel um, and, and the, the girls and the young women continue to intersect with her and to appreciate her, I think, and to also understand how, even though they might be homesick for their years in America, the Empress Haruko had never gotten a chance even to experience that. And there was a poignance to, I think, at one point, Alice in, in a Japanese interior writes about how it's so much more fun to be a Yankee schoolmistress than a Japanese Empress. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this idea that maybe they could go and learn some stuff that would come back and, and reflect well on their family. They, they really did have a similar, there was, a, there was a sisterhood there, even though they weren't actually sisters. You know something about sisters. <laughs> and 12, they were paralyzed with fear and uh, probably not carrying notebooks. So the, what we know about how they felt then is their own memories much later. Um, there, was a, there was a fair amount of documentary evidence of people looking at them and thinking, God, well, that's not my daughter. You know, a little bit of, it's crazy to send these girls out there. Um, but there are poignant memories of them watching the coastline fade away and, you know, but these were, I, I, it's hard to know to what extent they were created later. I wish. But the kind of, of, of visceral and systemic racism that, say, Chinese laborers felt here wasn't happening to them, partly because they were seen as princesses. They were seen as emissaries of the top level of Japanese society. They weren't immigrants. They were coming here to study and leave. Um, they came to the East Coast. 
just to study. They, they weren't mixing up with the Chinese population in San Francisco much. Um, and so then they really didn't feel very much of that beyond the, the, the little irritations of people who wanted to gawk at them a little bit. Um, there's a very striking letter um, that Ume wrote when she was passing through San Francisco at the age of 18 going back to Japan. And she's writing to her foster mother in her very chatty faux American way going, oh my god, I can't believe how many Chinese are here. They're so dirty and they're so, they lie and they steal and you really have to be careful. It's, you know, you think Washington is overrun by black people. You should see the Chinese. And, and you know, your hair is standing up because you think, wait, you're not supposed to talk like that. But you, you sort of get a sense of, you know, what the kind of American mind that she had, you know, absorbed over these years. Um, she just didn't recognize that without her clothes and her friends, she could easily be mistaken for one of those Chinese kids. So. Thank you so much. So wonderful. The book is for sale. Thank you so much.